Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Clayton O'Neill. Uh, this is Sean Lynn. Uh, we're both principal engineers at Time Warner Cable. Um, and we're here today to tell you about some uh, network architecture changes that we've made recently that we think are maybe a little unusual and uh, we hope that you'll find interesting. So uh, at the beginning of the year, um, we were, just to give you a little bit of back history, um, we were running into some problems and um, just to give you kind of the where we were at that time. So um, we were using Neutron with Open vSwitch, VXLAN tenant networks. At that time, we were using Kilo. Um, and we had all of our virtual routers hosted on uh, one of three control nodes. Um, we didn't have HA routers in place. Um, and part of that was because we weren't sure how mature HA routers were in Kilo, but also because we were using the uh, L2 population driver, um, which wasn't supported with HA routers in Kilo. So at the beginning of the year, uh, Sean and I were on call in back-to-back -back weeks. and. Um, we had some uh, network reliability problems, and there was a, a number of issues uh, that were going on at the same time. Um, one, we had a customer that was being DOSed on a pretty regular basis. Um, we also had an environment that was close to running out of capacity. And um, we also had some NIC mis misconfigurations that was really reducing the uh, capacity of that environment. And to fix that, we were gonna have to reboot all of our control and compute nodes, which we weren't real happy about doing to our customers. Uh, and lastly, we had a network upgrade that was uh, ongoing and was behind schedule, and um, we knew was going to fix a lot of these problems, but we weren't quite there yet. Uh, the, the real issue that we were running into, though, is that when we had these capacity issues, uh, our control nodes would get overloaded, and um, sometimes they would crash, uh, sometimes they just become non-functional, and really highlighted a big problem that we had, um, which was that uh, when these nodes go down, um, we'd lose networking for uh, a third of our customers because of the virtual routers were hosted there. So everybody has nodes fail. It's something that everybody has to deal with. But uh, the failure mode in this particular circumstance was really unacceptable. We needed to figure out what are our options for um, working around this or other things that we can do to kind of alleviate this issue. So we started working on all of the problems because we knew that we had more than one. But um, specifically, the, one of the solutions we were looking at is, um, you know, are there other network um, architecture or neut neutron deployment options that would make more sense that would help us alleviate this issue? Uh, and moving to dedicated network nodes was kind of one of the things that we were um, most interested in looking at and seeing, you know, how that might help us with the problems that we were having. So if you go look at the OpenStack reference architecture, um, you'll see a diagram that looks a lot like this, probably this diagram. And uh, it's what this shows is dedicated network nodes. So um, what this means for us, if we were to make that transition, is that we'd move all of those virtual routers that we had onto dedicated hardware. Um, one of the concerns we had with this is we weren't sure how much the load on our control nodes was related to the virtual routers that were hosted there versus <coughs> the other API services that were hosted on the same machine. Uh, so Sean did some testing, and he's going to talk about that in a little bit. But the, the short version of that is, is that um, we weren't seeing a whole lot of impact from uh, both a CPU and a RAM uh, standpoint uh, whenever we were doing our testing, um, even if we were pushing gigabits of traffic through these boxes. And so that kind of raised the question of, um, what's the utilization on these boxes going to be like? Um, and we were kind of wondering, even if we set up three con uh, dedicated network nodes, how much are we really going to be using these things? Um, and the problem with three network nodes that we saw was that um, we still have this problem with failure group size. Uh, we're going to um, have the same failure mode that we have already, where if one box dies, we would lose networking for a third of our boxes. So it seemed like going to more than three would pretty much be a requirement to get any improvement. Um, in that particular aspect. Um, so even if we went to five or 10, um, the concern there was is that we'd be wasting uh, valuable resources that we could be used for customers in other ways. So we, dedicated network nodes still seemed like the leading option, but, because mo but mostly because we were having a hard time coming up with other ideas. So we got together to kind of brainstorm some ideas um, and kind of figure out, well, what are our options, what are the pros and cons of all these, what would detailed implementation actually look like? 
Um, and one of the things we started wondering is maybe we could co-locate this with some other service instead of control node services. And, um, and that would give us the ability to spread these routers around, um, reduce our failure group size, and also put less in load on each individual node that we would be putting that on. And so the dumb idea was, what if we put this on compute nodes? Um, that has the big advantage that we have a lot of compute nodes. Um, it, that allows us to spread things around. But it also um, seemed like a good candidate because it doesn't make compute nodes any more important than they already are. Whenever we have a compute node failure, we always have customer impact. Um, and we always have to treat that uh, in a very um, serious manner. So that seemed like maybe something that would work out. Um, so we started wondering, though, why, isn't it, why haven't we heard of anybody else doing this? Um, you know, there must be something wrong with this idea. Uh, so we started talking to other team members. Um, we talked to some other operators. And we talked to a couple of Neutron developers. And the we got some varied feedback, um, things we should think about. But the reaction was mostly the same as ours. This seems like it should probably work, but we've never heard of anybody trying this. Um, so we started coming up with a more detailed analysis and, hey, wh what would the packet flows look like and things along those lines. And uh, Sean's going to kind of go through what we came up with as far as the um, pros and cons of this approach. Yeah, thanks, Clayton. Uh, before we get into the gory details of different packet flows and all our options that we considered, let's uh, be really clear. We have particular server and, and networking at Time Warner that kind of uh, alleviates a lot of design decisions. We have a lot of bandwidth, uh, both coming out of our servers and on our physical network. And we have very, very beefy servers with lots of RAM and lots of CPU. So that kind of changes our design point decision making as well. And as Clayton mentioned, we use VXLAN and uh, OVS in, inside of Neutron. Um, and uh, let's get back to the, some of the testing that we did. We wanted to know the impact of uh, you know, what exactly does a virtual router take up uh, as far as CPU, as far as RAM, other server resources. And so we tested both a single router and a 50 router scenario. And in both of those cases, uh, what we found is that it's essentially negligible impact to CPU, RAM, and overall server load um, from a Linux perspective uh, to have virtual routers. What, what, is, what you would expect out of that, though, is that we can consume every bit of bandwidth going in and out of the NIC. Um, <clears throat> I was a little bit surprised at the outcome of the testing based on uh, OVS. I expected OVS to take a lot more resource than it actually does for this virtual router scenario. So as Clayton mentioned, we had this crazy idea, but we did consider a lot of different options. And fundamentally, they come down into four different kind of uh, ideas. One is traditional network nodes. And you can go two ways with this. You can have really beefy servers with tons of networking and, and very few of them. Or you can horizontally scale out and have cheaper servers uh, spread out your fail failure domain. <coughs> A second option is to have DVR. But we were a little bit, uh, but still this requires uh, network nodes at this point. And uh, so we'd still have to come back to a solution for that. And then third is our idea, which we're terming VRD, just to make up new acronyms, um, which is traditional virtual routers, that's is legacy or HA, that are distributed amongst the compute nodes. And let's be really clear, this isn't anything groundbreaking. This is kind of a novel implementation of a reference architecture. And there's also uh, solutions away from mainline Neutron, like Contrail, uh, Plum Grid, et cetera. But uh, we'd like to stay with mainline Neutron unless it's not providing our customers with what they need and it's not providing us with scalability and reliability. Pardon me. <coughs> so within the realm of mainline Neutron, we really have uh, network nodes, DVR, and this VRD concept. And let's discuss these in more detail. Clayton had a similar uh, slide up earlier, but this is essentially network nodes, um, however you implement it. Uh, essentially, you have uh, your L3 agent 
and your metadata agent that are exist on dedicated servers at this point. <coughs> but why would you pick network nodes? Well, first of all, it's a reference architecture, so there's a lot of documentation on it. It's easier to support. It's easy to scale and to think about it. And the biggest reason that we could come up with is if you have a lot of east-west traffic, uh, BM to VM, but not a lot of north-south traffic out to the internet, it's probably an ideal case for these uh, network nodes. <coughs> but let's talk about a little bit about our different options with network nodes. As I mentioned before, um, <coughs> you can have gigantic servers, lots of bandwidth coming out of them. But as, as we found out, these servers are generally idle, except for bandwidth usage. In addition, you have pretty large failure domains. If you're running hundreds and hundreds of routers, <coughs> the, impact of, uh, the impact of one of these servers failing is pretty high. And there's also a cost to rebuilding those. So once those servers boot back up, there's a long time and a lot of overhead to rebuild all those routers and, and reconstruct the flows in OVS. This is generally getting better. Pardon me. <coughs> this is generally getting better release after release, but it's still a cost of doing these. And we also considered scaling, uh, you know, getting cheaper nodes and scaling them horizontally. But again, it's, it's largely a waste of resource, and there was some operational overhead for us to carve off a new, net, or a new type of server and to, uh, to, to make that function in our automation. The next option we considered is DVR. <coughs> you still require network nodes at that point. Um, but they have a lot less responsibility. They're only used when you're not using a floating IP and you have to get out to the internet via an external gateway. And, and this yet doesn't have quite have HA built in, so we're still back uh, for part of our traffic flows to our original problem, so it's not really solving it in that respect. Um, and the funny thing about uh, DVR is that functionally, you still have to have, you, uh, you have the L3 agents placed on the compute nodes, which is exactly what we were proposing, but underneath the mechanism in which the uh, flows are, the flows are uh, put forth are, are fundamentally different. And then at <coughs> Time Warner, we were concerned about DVR's readiness for production, um, its ability to uh, scale to what we need it to. It require a ton of operational tooling changes for us and a large retrofit underneath the hood. So it wasn't really a great, uh, great solution for us. <coughs> but still, there's a lot of commonalities, so I'd like to quickly walk through some uh, stylized packet flows. Um, kind of have four in this case. Uh, one is east-west traffic between VMs. This is illustrated in orange. Um, and this is actually the same path that it'll take in traditional legacy routers and in our implementation of that. Um, the second is the fundamental difference between DVR and what we ended up implementing, and that's illustrated in purple. It's a north-south flow with, uh, with floating IPs. And, and again, purple is the chief difference between the legacy and HA routers, what we were using, what we are using and uh, DVR. And then you have, have some specialty cases um, where, that are illustrated in blue, where you could co-locate the virtual routers and VMs. This is what we're proposing and what we're doing. And also where VMs need to talk to VMs within uh, the same hypervisor host. So I just wanted to illustrate that. And now back to our dumb idea. Again, we're, there's so many commonalities at a high level between what we're proposing and what we're using and DVR that we just made up an acronym. <laughs> and uh, the biggest thing here is that uh, L3 agent and Nova Compute are on the same nodes, physical nodes. You have that with DVR as well. <laughs> 
but your virtual routers are co-located in the same space as VMs. Um, and some of you may be wondering about the potential uh, of VMs, VM bandwidth, VM networking conflicting with virtual router networking. Yeah, keep that in mind. Clayton will come back to that in a little bit. But let's, uh, if you can remember the previous packet flow, there's really uh, four packet flows in this case, and I'm really showing three because two are fundamentally the same. Um, the orange flow is VM to VM, and that's exactly the same between DVR and, uh, and legacy and HA routers. Um, north to south with a floating IP, this is the biggest difference between DVR and, uh, and legacy and HA routers. <laughs> um, because all the, pa or the packets have to go to a virtual router and be natted out of the virtual router and go out to the internet. And in DVR, they, uh, the NAT is handled straight on the compute node with no virtual router in between. Commonality between, for north-south traffic between uh, DVR and this VRD solution is uh, <coughs> where an external gateway is requir required. Both DVR and, and uh, legacy routers uh, require the virtual router when you have an external gateway. So um, that, that's a commonality. And again, we have some specialty cases that I highlight simply because we had some test scenarios that wanted, we wanted to test uh, VM to VM bandwidth where it's on the same hypervisor and what were the impacts of having a virtual router and a VM with high traffic flows in between them on the same physical hardware. Uh, so when, when we started working on this presentation, uh, we had a placeholder in here in for implementation and automation, and uh, this is about as far as it got, because to be honest with you, the implementation is pretty straightforward. Um, for us, uh, for the most part, this was telling Puppet that uh, our compute nodes should have L3 agents on them. Um, of course, we realized afterwards we also needed to have the metadata agent on those boxes, but uh, we couldn't boot any instances after that. That's, depending on how you handle metadata, maybe a problem you'll run into. And, um, but past that, that was uh, the actual implementation of this is really pretty straightforward. Um, we kind of thought that it was going to be more involved, to be honest with you. Um, you know, that being said, um, that's not to say that we haven't run into uh, problems along the way. There have been a couple of issues. Um, if you're interested, if you think this is an approach you might be want to pursue, there are a couple of things you should be aware of. And so I want to talk through that real quick. Um, so launchpad bug. 149, 88, 44. This is the, the biggest problem that we've run into. And uh, the issue here is, is that uh, the L3 agent um, talks to Neutron Server to you know, uh, provision routers and things along those lines. And uh, all of those queries are handled in a single thread in Neutron Server. So uh, this is fixed in Mataka. Um, the backport stalled is actually not accurate. This merged last week. I should have updated that. Um, but what this does is the, the fix allows it to handle uh, queries from L3 agent and other plugins in all of the threads that Neutron is running. Uh, and what this means is you go from a single thread to tens of threads, um, depending on how you've configured Neutron server. So we you know, anticipate that this is going to um, largely alleviate this problem, but we don't have the fix in our environment yet. Um, one thing to note about this, this bug was originally um, reported with DVR, and it's really a generic running lots of L3 agents um, problem. So we, if we had pursued DVR, we would have run into the same issue. Um, so the way that this problem uh, shows up is uh, we do monitoring for the size of our queues uh, in RabbitMQ. Uh, and what will happen is that basically the uh, queue that uh, L3 agent sends all of its messages to Neutron server starts to grow, gets bigger, and really sometimes it would recover, but a lot of times it wouldn't. It would just continue to grow, and we would have to manually intervene. And what's happening there is, is that uh, the L3 agents are sending messages trying to ask Neutron server for things, and that one thread on the Neutron server is just falling behind. It's trying really hard, but it's not catching up. So we saw this problem uh, with uh, over 100 L3, LG, L3 agents um, just with those agents sitting there mostly idle. So there was a little bit going on in the environment, but this was mostly the L3 agent coming up to Neutron server and saying, hey, if anybody does an agent list, let them know that I'm still here. Um, so the workaround for us for this was to not deploy L3 agents on all compute nodes. So we picked 20 uh, nodes for L3, for, uh, L to put L3 agents on. 
Um, and we felt like that was a good trade-off between not running into this problem, but also giving us the failure group size that we were looking for. So now we're in a situation where if we do lose one of those compute nodes that has routers on it, we'd lose roughly 5% of those. Um, and that's a lot more manageable than a third. Uh, the next issue that we ran into is uh, the first time we did a deploy that changed in the L3 agent configuration. And so that restarted the L3 agent. Whenever we do our deploys to compute nodes, we do 40 nodes at a time. And that meant that all of these nodes restarted in a pretty short period of time. When those L3 agents start up, they go to Neutron Server and they say, hi, can I please have a list of all the routers that I should be responsible for? And Neutron Server gets inundated by all of these guys coming up and asking for these things. And it's working really hard. It's trying to get all this data out of the database. But what we found is, is that with the number of L3 agents, not really that many, to be honest with you, um, it frequently couldn't respond in a time period that the L3 agent found acceptable. So what would happen is, is that all these L3 agents would come in, request their status, and uh, they would have gone away and said, hey, look, I'll check back later by the time um, by the time Neutron Server could answer. And so in our environment, we saw the L3 agents never recover from the situation on their own. It required manual intervention. Uh, and what we ended up doing when we did run into this is uh, we would shut down the L3 agents on all of the nodes affected, and we would bring them up a couple at a time. And that was pretty workable, but this clearly not a long-term solution. Um, so what we've done as a workaround for the time being is, uh, as I mentioned before, we normally do 40 compute hosts at a time. And what we've done is we've taken these uh, hosts that have routers on them, and we've moved them into a separate deployment group um, where we only do two at a time. And with that approach, we haven't uh, run into any issues with L3 agent restarts. It's not ideal, but it's a pretty workable um, solution for the time being, and hopefully once we have the fix for this bug in our environment, it's a fix that we'll be able to take back out. Um, so as I mentioned before, the easiest part was actually figuring out, hey, how do we put routers on compute nodes? Um, the uh, bigger problems have been more around operational complexity. Um, these aren't insurmountable, but it is a little bit more work. Um, uh, the biggest thing here is, is that it's one more thing to check whenever a node fails, um, and now that we have routers on these things. Um, and that kind of leads to uh, the next point, um, was that we also had to have tooling changes. So when we have a compute node fail, we have tooling that assists us in notifying customers that would be affected. So that tooling had to be updated so that we could notify customers whose routers would have been on that compute node. And so not a big deal, but something that had to be done. Uh, another example is we have tooling for uh, evacuating a compute host of all customer workloads before we would do any maintenance on it. And that had to be updated to move the routers off of in that environment. Um, one of the com things that is involved here that uh, makes this a little bit more complex also is that um, because of, uh, we don't have, we didn't say just compute nodes one through 20 are the ones that are gonna host routers. That would have been nice. Um, it would have made it a lot easier to figure out what's going on whenever you go to troubleshoot these things. Um, but because we already had existing compute nodes in place, um, the, it ended up being a little bit more sparse than that. Um, because we took into account rack topology and network topology whenever we placed those routers to make sure that um, we wouldn't lose a rack and lose all routers at the same time. Um, as Sean mentioned before, we, um, there is some uh, monitoring stuff that had to be updated. Most of that was pretty minor. Um, it was making sure that checks run in the right place and things along those lines. Um, but one of the things that we've not addressed yet is the capacity management aspect of this. So we do have monitoring in place around capacity management, but this does make the situation more complex because we're mixing that north-south traffic from the virtual routers and the east-west traffic for tenants. Um, it's a little bit more complex to figure out, hey, why is this thing running into capacity problems? So um, thankfully, we're in a situation where we've recently upgraded um, all of our, you know, our network environment. And so we have a lot of capacity. This is not like a pressing problem, um, but it is something we're aware of and something that we're going to need to address in the future. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, I want to talk about kind of what, we're, what our plans are in the near future and um, further on. Um, the number one item right now is that we want to move to HA routers. It's, uh, we upgraded Neutron to Liberty uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, HA routers is on the short list of things that we were looking for in Liberty. Um, we've been doing some testing on this, and we expect that whenever we get back from the summit, it's something that we're going to start working on uh, getting rolled out. Uh, part of that is also we've been looking at doing custom um, router scheduling. So um, we want to be able to do um, rack and network topology of aware HA router placement. 
Um, and as part of that, we're doing a custom plugin to be able to key that off of um, information from Nova about host aggregates and things along those lines. Um, another thing we've been talking about is also the possibility of taking into account resource utilization on those boxes. So for example, if we had a customer that had um, a com an instance that had a flavor that had no network limits on it or very high limits, we might not put routers on that node or, or vice versa. So that's another thing that we're taking into account. Uh, another thing that we have been thinking about is, is that initially our plan was to put routers on all compute nodes and we've backed off of that. Um, and as I mentioned, that's led to more operational complexity. But once this bug is fixed and we have the fix, um, the question is, do we go back to putting them on all compute nodes? And it seems like there's not really a clear answer to that at this point. Um, what we have works relatively well. We've already made the changes in our tooling to be able to work around these problems. So I think that's something, a decision that we'll have to make in the future. Uh, lastly, uh, the question is, you know, do we um, use DVR at some point? Um, there's a lot of good things to be said about the DVR approach. I think the biggest problem for us now is uh, maturity and HA router support. As Sean mentioned before, you still need an L3 agent that's gonna host uh, uh, that some of that traffic, and um, it doesn't support HA routers for that portion today. Um, there was a lot of work that happened in the Mataka cycle, and I think that it's scheduled to be uh, mostly finished up in Newton, so um, we're keeping an eye on this. Um, one of the things we're a little afraid of, and I think Sean alluded to earlier, is, is that there is a big change in the operational model with DVR, and so that's a lot of training um, for <laughs> troubleshooting and things along those lines that we already have that we're gonna have to rework for DVR. So, um, but that seems like where we probably would like to be long term. Um, so if you want to get in touch with Sean or I, um, uh, the, any of these mechanisms are a good way. Um, but I think we've got some time for questions if anybody has any. And if you do have a question, you should come to the mic apparently. The race is on. Uh, what kind of latency do you see with these virtual routers? Latency? With like latency added between communication of VM to VM or egress from VMs or ingress to VMs going through a virtual router. So it related to the change that we made, it's the same. Um, the latency that we saw in both architectures is fairly minimal. Um, I mean, there is some overhead because you may have some extra hops involved, but it's all over 10 gig Ethernet, so it's, it's not really significant. Is it in like microseconds difference or? Uh, mil, uh, low milli to micro, yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yes? Yeah, I noticed, I uh, can't help but notice that you uh, mentioned that you you knew about uh, solutions like Contrail or mm -hmm. Nuage from ALU that solved these problems you're describing like three years ago. I noticed you said you wanted to stay mainline neutron as long as possible. At what point though, where you're solving problems that have already been solved, does your time, the value of your time, start making you make lean maybe towards one of those solutions instead so that you don't have to roll all this yourself? We ask a similar question every day. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. We're, we've got things always under review. Really the, how bad, you know, how bad is the problem that we're experiencing? And, and how big is the retrofit cycle? Like if it's super painful, that's almost a non-starter for us. Yeah, so it, at this point, we're not doing a greenfield deployment, so the migration cost is, is going to be significant for moving to anything along those lines, and so that's definitely part of the, part of the discussion. Understood. Okay. Thanks. So from a security perspective, did you have any considerations to put in place for exporting the compute nodes outside? I missed the last part of the question. So the compute nodes had to be exposed to the internet, right? So there were no network topology changes that needed to be made. So this, uh, basically all of the network topology was already set up so that this could happen um, because we needed the connectivity for these nodes to be able to talk to the control nodes already. So it was, this was really purely software changes from, a, from, our, from our standpoint. So there wasn't, a, I don't think there was really any additional security concerns. We had already gone through that cycle of analysis because uh, <coughs> we support external networks for our customers. So, so we were already able to drop the traffic on an external VLAN from the compute nodes anyway. Yeah, maybe the big concern I have about DVR is it makes the compute nodes expose the internet. So I, I wanted to make sure that something like that is, is it taken into consideration in the line of DVR 
already, or because if you have the network node outside, then you can only you can only care about protecting the network node. Right. But if you have the compute nodes exposed outside, now you have a bigger uh, footprint to protect. Right, and we have that concern as well. Um, a lot of our a lot of our traffic is you know we own the network you know out to the internet as well, so we do have some you know DOS. DDoS uh, attacks that happen. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, we haven't seen too many things that uh, dropping dropping VMs directly on that VLAN that's exposed to the internet has happened. And but we are looking into it, and we do have some bigger mitigations in place outside of OpenStack, though, on the edge. Thank you. So, so uh, does your approach means uh, it requires a public IP address per compute, no compute node? Um, so you require a, 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 an IP address per router, but we already had that requirement. Mm -hmm. um, we already had public IPs for management sort of functions on those boxes already, but this didn't change um, our IP address usage because we already had, the, we're basically just moving the routers. Um, there was no additional IP addresses that were required, and, and that is an issue that some people raise with DVR as it stands today, is that it does require more IP addresses. Uh, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everybody.